Welcome to my presentation. So first, I would like to give you a brief introduction into my institute. We currently have four different departments and one independent group. So the first department is the one for computational material science from Professor Neugebauer. Next one is on structure and mechanics from Professor Dehm, also doing a lot of electron microscopy. My own department is about microstructure physics and alloy design. And we have another department by Professor Stratmann, which is currently headed by Michael Rohwetter on interface chemistry and surface science. And we have an independent group by Professor Scheu on nanoanalytics and interfaces. So the budget is about 23 million per year, and we have a, a very high fraction of third party funding and about 350 people on board. So the mission statement is that we are interested in the physics, chemistry, and the system science of complex materials, including engineering materials, which are exposed to real environments, and we study those if we have to down to the We do a couple of topics together across departmental borders. An example is that we try to invent new materials. This is an example where we worked on magnesium, lithium, ultra lightweight alloys. We do computational material science and machine learning across departmental borders. Here you see an example where we designed titanium based implant materials based on first principles. The Institute has a high strength on characterization of materials down to the atomic scale. Here you see an example on phase transformations studied at the atomic scale at grain boundaries. And we have growing interest in the fields of hydrogen embrittlement and hydrogen related materials behavior as well as corrosion. Here you see an example where we measure individual hydrogen atoms in materials. A rapidly emerging field is the sustainability of materials and sustainability through the use of advanced materials. So let's get to the topic today. The presentation will be about multiscale and multiphysics simulations of chemomechanical crystal plasticity problems for complex engineering materials using Damask. So I have to appreciate the kind collaboration with Professor Cem Tashan, with Lutz Morsdorf, Dirk Ponge, and on the EBSD side with Peter Koneinberg, Shun Tsai, and Stefan Zeffer. And I highlight the contributions of the authors as we go. Now generally, why is this topic of interest? We all know that we roughly produce 2 billion tons of material, particularly metallic materials, per year. This is associated with a huge environmental burden. Metallurgical production requires about 8% of the global energy and produces about 30% of all the industrial greenhouse emissions. On the positive side, though, there is a gigantic market we have a materials market exceeding 3,000 billion euros per year, uh, of which the metal market has the biggest fraction. And many examples are given here that you all know. So interesting is that we all know the properties of materials are requested at the macroscopic scales or at the microscopic scales when we talk about small instruments. But the defects must be studied and understood at the atomic and electronic scale. And what is really interesting is that complex interplay of defects, properties, and processing. And that means the assignment that we encounter here is that we want to have a quantitative digital twin of these metallurgical products and processes.
Now we know that mass and energy is of course conserved, but microstructure and properties are of course not conserved and they are also not in equilibrium. That means we need a very good description of kinetics in order to be able to put this into advanced theory that we can treat by corresponding boundary condition treatments. That means any digital twin, so the computational material science of complex materials in their transients must be microstructure and mechanism sensitive. So the take home message here from the introduction is that the properties depend on the microstructures and microstructures are imprinted through the processing of the material. And when we want to put this into mean field theory, we need to find mechanism-based formulation and microstructure-based formulation. Here's a simple example that everybody knows from the field of aluminum alloys. On the left-hand side, you see the tensile strength plotted. On the right-hand side, you see the alloy families. Now, some examples here are given of typical products, for instance, from the field of packaging that you all know, and the main alloying ingredients are highlighted. The field of aluminum alloys is a rapidly growing field due to requirements imposed by lightweight transportation. So what we learn from this slide and from this compositional trend is that we have a substantial influence of composition on the tensile strength of aluminum alloys here shown in terms of the different alloy families. And as you know, in aluminum alloys, most of these precipitates turn into nanoparticle and spinodal systems. But what is also very interesting as a take home message is to appreciate this huge variation here shown for the 7000 or 2000, also for the 6000 series alloys, like here, that there's a huge variation that can be influenced by microstructure and hence by processing. Now, when we talk about complex microstructures and their respective environments, what do we specifically mean? We all know we start at some crystalline level with these engineering materials and have single crystals and their symmetries. And we may have equilibrium thermodynamics with some solubility, like shown here. We have lattice structures that we can probe. But when we widen the view a bit, then we encounter more complex and extended defects such as 2D lattice defects, interfaces, stacking faults, uh, dislocation arrays, geometrically necessary dislocations, precipitates, orientations, which are referred to as crystallographic textures. We have surfaces, cracks, and so on. And all that is, as we said before, affected by the thermodynamics. And now when you expose such a complex material setting with so many types of defects and features, to an environmental condition like oxygen or hydrogen or nitrogen, then you realize what we mean by the complex interplay between materials defects and their chemical environments. So it means we talk about complex hierarchical defects and their chemistry, and that means microstructure has to go system science when we try to answer such a question. Let me give you an example from the field of dual phase steels. <clears throat> Here you see a typical microstructure of such a material consisting of body centered cubic ferrite and the shaded martensite, which is a transformed iron carbon uh, ingredient in the microstructure. These are very attractive materials that are, for instance, used for high strength components of cars. They have a high ultimate tensile strength called UTS. They have a low yield strength, which is good for forming operation. They have just about sufficient ductility for forming, good formability, no Luders bending, that means no dynamic strain aging. And they have quite tunable properties through the carbon content and through the volume fraction of the martensite. And they're really low cost materials. However, when you want to increase their strength further, you have to enhance the uh, uh, volume fraction of the martensite, and that would be ductility, for instance. Let us zoom in into such a microstructure. Here's a reconstructed former orthogenetic grain of such a portion of martensite. 
from which you can reconstruct by crystallographic means the packets and the LAS structures. And when you do that, you can also switch from the eBSD to the electron channeling contrast uh, imaging mode, as you see here. And then you can differentiate between the different types of LAS, mainly the fine one and the larger ones. And they play a big role, for instance, for the damaging behavior. When you view at the martensitic needles also edge on, you can appreciate when combining this with atom probe tomography that you have in part a very high carbon decoration at these LAV interfaces. This is interesting because we still teach our students that martensite has a frozen in uh, diffusionless transformation and hence the carbon should be frozen in where it was prior to the quenching. But in real microstructures, uh, during a quenching process, the carbon is capable of making a couple of diffusive jumps. So here's what I told you before, the relevance of this martensitic features uh, for damage initiation. Here you see very fine lath structures encountering a causal lath structure. And when this to an in situ tensile test, like here in the scanning electron microscope, you see that is, for instance, a region of damage and we will come back to this in, in much more detail. Here you see an interesting comparison between a dual phase steel, which is called DP800 due to its UTS level, and a so-called TWIP steel, which stands for Twinning Induced Plasticity Steel, which is typical in iron manganese carbon alloy. And from our typical rational, we would evaluate the mechanical features of such materials owing to the integral of the deformation energy that you see below the UTS curve here, below the flow curve. And hence you would assume that the TWIP steel has much higher forming capabilities and can absorb much higher deformation. Now let, let me test this in a typical crash box test setup. That is a critical test you would do for testing it under automotive uh, crash conditions. And here you see, interestingly, that the DP steel is actually performing much better than the TWIP steel, which is, uh, first of all, kind of surprising. But when you analyze the total um, deformation by digital image correlation taken on all points of such a deformed part, then you can interestingly see that the highly strained points are those, of course, where the material has buckled. And when you translate these uh, strained points, uh, but from the buckling area into the stress strain curve, you see that the highest deformed regions in such a crash box uh, do, not, do not exceed much like 10, 15 or 18 percent. And that means the fact that this material has a higher, much higher strain hardening rate for low strains means that the total integral that is really required for a crash box uh, design is the one not exceeding 18 or 20 percent total strain. That means this part, this uh, integral deformation energy of the TWIP steel is actually not really needed for the design. That means the energy absorption depends both on the material physics, of course, but also on the design of the part and on the loading scenarios. And that teaches us that any digital twin or any constitutive material model which we want to develop for these steels must reflect really the tensorial nature of the microscopic response and be able to react to complex macroscopic boundary condition treatment. So as a simulation approach, we use the Damask package that we have developed for about 25 years to serve the entry of crystal plasticity. You can see all the details actually on the, on the home page of Damask. This is just uh, to let you know that this is a coupled crystal plasticity phase field um, simulation package, which is based on mean field constitutive uh, simulation methods. And this is capable of treating mechanical temperature damage, phase transformation and diffusion related problems and can be also coupled to CALFAT. So I later come back to some features in more detail. Let me now show you a typical workflow when we apply such a situation like here DP steel uh, to such a simulation. Here you have a microstructure, as we saw it before, consisting of ferrite, 
those are the big grains, and the smaller martensite islands. First we equip the surface with a silica pattern which can be penetrated by the diffracting electrons, for instance for um, EBSD uh, pattern retrieval. And then we conduct in situ experiments as shown here in that workflow to obtain the deformation. And from the DIC patterns, that means digital image correlation patterns that we can retrieve from the surface, we can obtain the local deformations. Helpful in that context is that we are typically using in-lens detector setups so that you have a much smaller surface roughness. So these two pictures are taken um, with an in-lens detector setup and these with a conventional one. So when you want to have um, topology-free surface mapping, you should choose an in-lens detector setup. And then you get these deformation patterns from the surface of the material as you deform it. We will later see that in some materials many features must be also screened in the third dimension because the microstructure ingredients are so small that their three-dimensional topology matters for the predictive capability. And then you get the strain distributions for instance. And there are of course much more that you can do experimentally. This is just a standard routine that we show you here. Now let's switch to the Damask simulation strand. First you render the microstructure you want to simulate digital as shown here. You can do this through the image quality or through any other measure that allows you to differentiate between the different microstructure components. Then there are different ways of retrieving the single crystal constitutive parameters and you see here one method where we obtain them from screening their mechanical behavior locally from indentation. And then we run these microstructures in a finite element or in a spectral solver, so using fast Fourier methods and obtain the strain map and the stress map material. Let me take one step back uh, behind that workflow. First, let us look to the real textbook situation when we encounter activity of large dislocation numbers at a single crystal level. Here you can nicely see slip steps emerging at the surface of a deformed single crystal. And as you know, they are due to the dislocations that have sheared this material along specific Burgas vectors and glide planes. And of course, as these steps are uh, much bigger than one Burgas vector, we appreciate that they come from the same Frank Reed sources like indicated here from an in situ TEM study. And uh, meaning that at that surface, you of course have larger numbers of dislocations with the same Burgas vector uh, leaving the material causing these surface shear steps. In a median field setting, uh, to put this a bit more quantitative, this can be, for instance, captured through the so-called Orovan equation. And that expresses the shear rate, gamma dot, in terms of the mobile dislocation density, which you see here, the Burgas vector, so the elementary shear vector, which quantizes the entire system, and the velocity field or the average velocity of these mobile dislocations. That means you already here have a very simple coupling between a local shear rate and the dislocation content. So this is already some mean field coupling between elementary kinematics as we see it here through the surface steps and the defect content of that material. That could be of course also be mechanical twins or martensitic transformation events. So just to give you a flavor how this is formulated. Now the dislocation flow is then evaluated in terms of uh, effects that enhance the dislocation content such as activation of Frank Reed sources and other effects that reduce the dislocation density for instance through annihilation. And strain hardening must be expressed in terms of the reduction of the mean free pass of the mobile dislocations for instance here like shown through the occurrence of grain boundaries where the dislocations cannot penetrate. Higher complexity in steels and titanium alloys and so on of course comes through the occurrence of the so-called TRIP or TWIP effects where TRIP stands for transformation induced plasticity and TWIP stands for twinning induced plasticity and here you again see an C to TEM straining experiment where you can appreciate that here's a portion of martensite 
that is uh, not compatible and not commensurate with its environment, where it forms by a displacive mechanism, creating huge populations of dislocations here at the tip. And so this effect gives additional strain hardening when you form such martensite. Another important effect here related to a twip steel is the spatial confinement. You see here a twin, a mechanical twin form, which is very small, as you see here, and maybe only 200, 300 nanometers. And the frank wheat source is confined inside of this twin. And that, of course, enhances in a hyperbolic fashion the stress that is required to operate dislocation. Another important point to recall from the textbook is elementary single crystal kinematics. So we know that dislocation flow becomes active when reaching a certain critical shear stress on the respective glide plane. And this can be expressed in terms of the projection of the total stress tensor to the local glide systems, in terms of the Burgers vector and the glide vector. Uh, uh, glide plane. And when we look for a single crystal at this kinematic relation for a number of different slip systems, so we can, for instance, pick the 12 110 slip systems, where 110 is the glide plane and 111 over 2 would be the Burgers vector, then you have such a kinematic situation which would tell you when you have a generalized stress tensor, then in different directions you reach one of these slip systems and they would be active. So it's just a tensorial representation of what you call from a textbook, what you call a Schmidt uh, factor. This is of course a Schmidt matrix. Now we take the second slip system, adding also the 112 glide planes in body-centered cubic materials like ferrite or BCC titanium, and you get a higher number of degrees of kinematic freedom. And when you even add one to three pencil glide systems, then you see that you can get at a single crystal even a relatively homogeneous, even for Mises type of activation of plastic deformation. And that means this Schmidt tensorial behavior lives at every integration point of such a mean field as we use it in Damask. A very simple, but I think educational wise helpful reflection is about the boundary conditions. Here you see a simple single crystal test and you see that the single crystal is running out of its constraints. And the fact that you do such an experiment under fixed boundary conditions like a uniaxial tensile test or the appearance of neighborhood grains or what have you means that you have a certain orientation change across the length of such a single crystal required only due to the fact that you have site constraints from the environment. So it means these geometric constraints lead to specific crystal rotations. And any non-symmetric dislocation or uh, martensitic shear must lead to a rotation of the system. And symmetric shear in very rare cases can also lead to cha changes without crystallographic rotations. But these are very singular points in the single crystal yield surface where this happens. And also you can see that the constraints, the geometrical neighborhood, if you want, changes across a certain grain or single crystal and so on, means that you also have necessarily in all crystals have ingrained heterogeneity of your constraints of the rotation. Let's turn for a moment towards continuum uh, kinematics. Here you have a volume of material represented in terms of these two points, one and two. And now we attach to each of those neighboring points a displacement vector u. Now the magnitude and direction of this displacement vector at the coordinates 1 and 2 is the same. And when these two points represent the entire volume in macroscopic continuum kinematics, that means you only have shifted that portion of volume. So there is no distortion, no strain. When we repeat that thought experiment, and apply again displacement vectors to both of these adjacent points, but assume now that their direction or magnitude, like shown here, is not identical, then you have a gradient of the displacement vector over this spacing between 1 and 2. 
And this essentially gives rise to what we call a distortion or a strain. That means the physics origin um, that we have to translate into constitutive uh, flow of dislocations or other shear carriers is actually the displacement gradient and not what we call a strain. The strain is just one helpful linear measure to translate a displacement gradient field into measurable macroscopic quantities, but the real physics quantity is the displacement gradient tensor. Here's an additive decomposition. You can also choose polar decomposition for certain reasons, as we do in Damask. Now with that, we have a number of informations assembled that live on each integration point of your solver when you do Damask simulations. You, of course, have the elastic anisotropy tackled. Then you can represent the phase fractions from Calfat, for instance, at each integration point. Then you need a constitutive law that describes the defect dynamics, where we typically use classical mean field formulations in the classical cox mecking estrin type of formulations. And I explained already briefly how we can make them uh, compatible um, to the kinematics of these systems by using the O1 equation. Then we need the single crystal kinematics. I had shown you the single crystal yield surface already. And then we need, of course, the information which orientations we locally have. We can retrieve them, for instance, from EBSD measurements or statistically from X-ray measurements. Then we can also choose at an integration point whether we need a homogenization, whether we need to mix an average ensemble of texture components or crystals or phases. So that can be also done with submodels that describe a certain averaging technique. And since recently, we also incorporate damage evolution. I will come to back, back to this also briefly. We do this in a very in a, um, in a newly formulated uh, Alan Kahn type of uh, formula. Here's an old example, which is uh, 20 years old, of a simple high purity aluminum crystal. And it consists of a number of very big grains. Otherwise, it's, it's of high purity. And it was subjected to a small load of 3% in a channel dye experiment that I show here in this little animation. So we have a quasi plain strain deformation of this material. Now, when you probe the resulting strain distribution in this high purity material after 8%, you see it's extremely heterogeneous with very high deformations here or here or here and practically no deformation here in that center grain. It is practically not deform and not rotate much. If you push the total deformation in this channel die set up to 15%, you see that these grains have been heavily deformed, exceeding 20% in part, like here. And again, this center grain, which is a rotated Gauss orientation, by the way, has not been plastically deformed, or at least only very little. That means you see that there is already at this high purity, at this very simplified experiment, a very high inhomogeneity of the plastic response simply coming from the kinematics of the grain. This was done uh, also then tackled by a Damas simulation already 20 years ago to capture some of the main effects. That was also repeated in a three-dimensional setting where we again did very similar tensile testing experiment with very coarse grained material, did finer element calculations on that, and compared the resulting experimentally observed with a simulated strain. Now, let me do a more detailed description of how we apply it to these DP steels that I have explained in the beginning. Here's a typical microstructure. Um, where we do a full field analysis from EBSD and then a simulation. So the simulation, according to the workflow that I've shown you before, when you extend the material, we get a couple of really interesting results. You get an average deformation around seven to 800 megapascal. But what you interestingly can see that you have certain areas like shown here or here, where you easily reach uh, local stresses or exceeding a gigapascal. And you even have areas like here where you have a compressive stress, although the overall load is a tensile one.
which is simply due to the fact that these two very hard adjacent, adjacent areas start compressing locally uh, a grain portion among them. So you can really uh, study the heterogeneity of the in such a complex material. And when you compare that step by step carefully between experiment and simulation, then you see that some of the features come out quite nicely, but in other areas you have quite still a discrepancy or a disagreement between the experimentally observed pattern of deformation and the simulated one. And for that is that of course these microstructures with their very tiny and complex martensite topologies uh, must be considered in three dimensions, not in two dimensions. So we do that um, since a couple of years by using a full, fully automated 3D serial sectioning technique as shown here through the use of such a robot where we have samples that are polished in a fully automated way and we use markers to track the exact uh, removal of the surface material step by step. So the movie has been a little bit accelerated, of course. And then the robot takes the sample totally autonomously and the robot would open the microscope. That's here at size Gemini where we use this system. And then we put the sample into the microscope. And then the robot closes the microscope and starts fully automatic the operation of the EBSD or whatever microstructure analysis you want to do as you see here. So all the system has been developed in-house in our institute. And so after the measurement, the robot would open the chamber, take the sample out and do the next ensuing um, polishing step. So this is something that we that we have developed over the past 10 years, it's now fully operative. And then you can do all kinds of uh, tomographic analysis, like here, corrosion analysis as a function of the type of the grain boundary in full 3D and so on. But first of all, regarding our presentation today, you can also retrieve such fully three-dimensionally characterized portions of crystalline material. This is here the work of Peter Kuneinberg and Stefan Seffer mainly, including all the crystallographic information about the interfaces. This shows a little example on copper uh, with a very high fraction of 60 degree 111 twin interfaces. So all that can be fully characterized. It can be used, like shown here, also for subsequent meshing in, uh, uh, for a Damask finite element or spectral calculations. You see both the interfaces and the full structure. So we did the same thing also for the DP steels. Put the data into a spectral solver and expose it to 23% uniaxial deformation as shown here. And then you get in full 3D the stress and the strain distribution. And that is particularly important when you have a very fine, finely structured micro, such as in the case of uh, such dual phase steels with a very fine martensite topology. Here's another example where we took a bigger set of material, now also fully probed in three dimensions, as you see here. Again, that was rendered digital. And then here you see the simulations both in terms of the equivalent strain and the Formesis equivalent stress plotted. And again, now you get, when you compare this in detail to the experiments, a much higher fidelity between the simulation and the experiment. And this can be attributed to the fact that you have a now much more complete three-dimensional description of the microstructure. You also see the fine banding that is evolving in the material and so on, along, of course, the soft ferritic regions. And later, what becomes important for damaging simulation and damaging understanding, you also can identify the hotspots where very high mechanical stresses occur, typically at the interfaces between a hard martensite portion and a very soft adjacent ferrite region with very strong um, mechanical contrast. Now I jump 
from the microscopic to the macroscopic direction, you can also use such information to uh, subject it to a local RVE calculation, where RVE stands for representative volume element, which you then use as an integral response to feed it, for instance, as a constitutive flaw here into a commercial fine element calculations uh, from Mark. Or you can do the same with Abacus. But as you see here from the appearing earring, from the uh, deep drawing operation, uh, this is fully informed by the underlying physics. Now, a very important aspect I've mentioned before is that steels, of course, contain microscopic damaging features. And our efforts are currently going in a direction where we simulate those also. Here's a little overview for the field of dual phase steels again. This is our blueprint material, our white mouse system today, so to say, where we analyzed martensite volume fraction over ferrite grain size for many different scenarios. And you get certain maps where what kind of damage would prevail, decohesion or martensite fracture and so on. And we try to identify corresponding mechanical hotspot situations also shown here from the corresponding uh, crystal plasticity damask. Here are two such examples shown, where you see how the decohesion proceeds along the soft, heavily strained ferrite areas, and also where you can have a crack propagation to a crack portion of martensite that you see here. So this type of model that we use here is in principle related to classical Griffith formulations, but cast into Ginzburg-Landau formalism, which means that you derive an energy functional which includes the elastic anisotropies and elastic energies, the ones for plastic deformation energy also, and of course the free surfaces that you have to form when you open a crack. And these three energy contributions enter into one functional which you integrate into the plasticity code. And that is currently the field where we work on very actively in order to have a complete coupling to the mechanical and the damaging features. Now, in a way, we also combine the crystal plasticity simulations in Damask with phase field calculations of phase transformation or Oswald ripening phenomena. Here you see an example where you have an evolving morphology of a spinodal decomposition from left to right. You see a classical Oswald type causing as a function of time plus the associated evolution of the fully coupled stress field, here the hydrostatic stress, and the plastic strain when you translate some of the energy release in terms of the plastic uh, strain accommodation. And of course you have the same thing for elasticity and so on. That means we have now a fully coupled elastoplastic uh, phase transformation and fracture coupled simulation up and running. So that is, uh, I think, where we currently stand. Just one quick word about our current field of microtexture. Here you see a classical coarse grit, and we have currently experimented with a couple of grit refinement techniques. And I share that with you in the, on the next slides. All of this is not yet published. So you see here three examples um, of thickness reduction around 50% for the three different grits. And push this a little bit further, we go to 75% thickness reduction here on this uh, relatively pure IF steel, so close to BCC iron. Then you can see that for the fine grid, for the where we subjected the simulation to a, a very high grid refinement, you have now a fidelity of your microtexture simulation, which reminds you really uh, more or less of an experimental EBSD plot. So you get a very, very high fidelity out of the simulation. Just to say it very clearly, this picture that you are seeing here is not an EBSD experiment. This is a Damask simulation with mesh refinement. So with that, I'm coming to the end. Um, as I showed in between, we have with Damask an evolving package with crystal plasticity, temperature, damage, phase transformation, uh, transport and so on. We have many industry and academic partners all over the world and this is just a small set of them. There are many more also big companies with whom we develop specific solutions together. Now the latest topic on which we work quite intensely 
as I said, is the damage evolution. So these orange colored uh, interfaces show just the emergence of damage inside of the microstructures. But we also work quite intensely uh, on the side of RVE upscaling, where we can take patches of such microstructures to do local RVE calculations that allow you to adapt, for instance, on the fly advanced yield surface formulations that you can directly use in commercial large scale simulations, for instance, in the automotive industry and for materials design. So with that, I thank you very much for your attention and I would be delighted to take questions. Thank you.